Australia's native plants and animals have adapted to life on an isolated continent over millions of years, evolving over eons into unique and amazingly varied species. Then came Europeans. But it's not just the people that changed the land forever. It's also what came with them. Over the next hour, you'll witness the devastation of the lands and the waterways. The ceaseless slaughter of native animals and the savagery of man's revenge. On Savage Australia, feral invaders. Since 1788, about 11% of the country's 273 native mammals have gone extinct. Australia is an island ark. It's home to an extraordinary diversity of life. One of the major impacts on this diversity of life are pest animals. The appalling fact is that millions of animals are killed by feral attack every single day. Whether it be wild dogs, feral cats, rabbits, foxes, they all have a major impact on our threatened species, wildlife and, and our landscapes more generally. It's an unmitigated environmental disaster. It's ironic that over the years, Australia has developed some of the strictest quarantine laws in the world. If it grew or breathed, we'd bin it or spray it. But even though countless pests have been stopped at the arrivals hall, the horse had bolted a long time before. Tally-ho, the dogs are on the scent and the wild pigs dash for cover. Feral pigs are a foreign menace that rip into sheep and lambs and decimate the Australian landscape. Hunters in the 1940s trained their dogs to bring down pigs without hurting them so they could be sold later. It was dangerous and sometimes the dogs wouldn't survive. It's easy to see how they kill lambs. How would you like a rip from that tongue? 60 years later, Australia's foremost feral animal expert, Tony Peacock, says that feral pigs are leading the Australian foreign pest epidemic. He's a big bugger. Big old fat mass. Now, we don't even know how many feral pigs are out there. It could be 20 million pigs. But the reality is, if there's 20 million of these guys, you can see how much ploughing he's done. That's 20 million ploughs in the Australian landscape. It's not an option to just stick your head in the sand and decide that it's not a problem. Domestic pigs have been around since the arrival of the first fleet. They were kept by early settlers, unrestricted and in semi-feral conditions. Stock could readily escape and wander, and by the 1880s, pigs had run wild in New South Wales. Feral pigs have since become an agricultural and environmental nightmare. They're found in all states and territories, particularly around river systems and wetlands. Destruction of crops, especially sugarcane in Queensland, have turned farms into battlegrounds. And farmers are on the front line. It needs a serious attack and it's got to be a planned attack. Almost an all-out war against them. The ploughed up earth is carried with the rainwater down creeks and into the ocean, silting up the Great Barrier Reef. It's an environmental pigsty. And just next door, another of Australia's iconic landmarks is suffering from the effects of this feral invader. The Daintree Rainforest in northern Queensland is renowned for its ancient beauty. Believed to be one of the oldest forests in the world, it's home to animals and plants found nowhere else. It's a nature lover's paradise, but many areas have been ripped apart, ravaged by feral pigs. This sort of diggings here cause extensive erosion and um, siltation of the streams. Nearby banana and sugar growers have lost millions of dollars and endangered wildlife is under siege. It's estimated there are around 12 animals per square kilometre, but authorities and locals have fought back. Contracted trappers have been catching up to 400 pigs a year. It's arduous work, particularly in the wet season when the pigs go to ground. The pig hunters use old logging tracks and follow the paths of creeks and rivers to access the impenetrable rainforest to lay traps baited with bananas.
the pigs are shot while still in the trap. Feral pigs are mostly disease-ridden and full of parasites, so the meat is essentially inedible. One of the proposed solutions to the problem of feral animals, including pigs, is recreational shooting. Two and a half thousand kilometres south, in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales, it's a frosty early morning. And these intrepid shooters are out hunting down their prey, the feral pig. I love animals, but these animals are killers themselves. There are millions of them. It's a good thing for some of us to be doing something about. We're environmental sheriffs. <laughs> there we go. This morning's hunt may serve a practical purpose, but it's not all about pest control. Yeah, when I go for a shoot, and just the peace and quiet of it, you're not stomping around the bush, you know, you're being very gentle, very quiet, you're stalking. Generally, it's, it's just communing with nature and then killing it. But when it comes to dangerous feral invaders, size doesn't matter. These little creatures have brought disease and destruction on a grand scale. Australia already had around 60 species of native rat, but the problem started with the arrival of these guys, the black and brown rat. They carried with them death. In 1899, the dreaded bubonic plague had spread to the Pacific, and Australian colonial authorities were acutely aware that it was only a matter of time before the disease reached their continent. It arrived via rats aboard cargo ships from Hong Kong on the 19th of January, 1900. Ships brought wave after wave of infection to the crowded, unsealed streets around Sydney Harbour, packed with hastily built shanties for the city's dock labourers. Squadrons of rat catchers were formed in the next few months. Tens of thousands of vermin were killed and burned in special rat incinerators, with some councils paying sixpence a head, making the pestilence very profitable. The infected were quarantined at Sydney's North Head, with more than 1,700 people sent to the station. Many would never leave. Between March and July 1900, the rocks and waterfront areas were barricaded off, disinfected and often demolished. By the time the outbreak was over in August 1900, a total of 303 cases had been reported with 103 deaths. An early warning as to the dangers of a seemingly innocuous feral invader. But the rat has a nasty little cousin, the house mouse. Plagues of house mice occur in the grain growing regions of southern and eastern Australia around every four years. As the mice congregate around food sources during plagues, their density can reach a staggering 3,000 mice per hectare. One suggested cause is that, as an introduced species, mice don't have natural predators in Australia, allowing their numbers to grow alarmingly. Serious mouse infestations have occurred in grain growing areas for more than a century. Plagues are common following exceptionally good cropping seasons. In 1993, in South Australia, Australia's biggest mouse plague caused approximately $96 million worth of damage. The mice destroyed thousands of hectares of crops, attacked livestock, damaged vehicles and ruined buildings. Kill one in 150 come to the funeral. Solutions have been hard to come by. Apart from some natural methods, Spraying crops with the poison strychnine has been found over the years to be the best way of controlling the vermin. In desperation, genetic solutions are now being considered. Scientists are looking at sex reversal, creating a population of only one sex, which would eliminate them in one generation. But the technology, for now, just isn't available, and the house mouse remains an ever-present threat. Roaming the Australian bush, there are bigger versions of the feral menace, packs of wild dogs. Domestic dogs gone feral, the iconic pure dingo, and hybrids between the two. 
Dingoes are descended from wolves and arrived in Australia around 5,000 years ago. They're seen by many as being partly responsible for the extinction of the thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, on the mainland around 2,000 years ago. There are more dingoes now than at any other time in their history, due to man providing handy waterholes and the ultimate fast food in the form of rabbits. Since rabbits have come out to this country, um, rabbits arrived out here um, probably about the turn of the century, and um, they tend to occur in very, very large numbers, and together with the provision of waters, um, it provides a, a haven for dingoes. Not many animals, apart from humans, hunt for sport. They'll get into a mob of kangaroos and they'll kill three or four, uh, and they'll eat one or one and a bit and they'll leave the rest, just for fun. But dingoes have also developed a taste for humans. In Uluru, Central Australia, 1980, a dingo attack made world headlines. A dingo snatched and killed nine-week-old baby Azaria Chamberlain from the tent where she slept. Her mother, Lindy Chamberlain, initially accused of murdering Azaria, was immortalised by this phrase. Dingo's got my baby. The body of Azaria was never found despite extensive searches. The blood-stained clothing was the only evidence the child had been killed. Australia Museum's David Bock thinks it was classic dingo behaviour. The dingo was clearly being opportunistic. It would have been hanging around the campsite, looking for food, and it just saw this as an option and took it, and the rest is history. Doubts surrounded the death until dingo attacks became more frequent. There's only one known remedy for this national pest, and that is ceaseless killing by every available means. It's been this way in Australia for 150 years. For many, one of the gentlest animals in existence has been seen as the most destructive, despised creature to walk the earth. He's an introduced animal, and I think the only way we're going to get relief out of him is to try and exterminate him completely. But despite every effort, the rabbit remains. Two mating rabbits can produce 33 million relatives in just three years. And the effect rabbits have had on the ecology of Australia has been devastating. Looking at this, you'd think there was enough grass here for livestock, native animals and rabbits. But it's an illusion. The rabbits have destroyed permanent grasses and shrubs and left the greener surface weeds. A few years later, this land will become a dust bowl, riddled with erosion. Even the rabbits will die, and it's a cycle that's been repeated through the years. If fodder is plentiful, they eat the best of it. If scarce, they eat the lot. Unless checked, they stop the regrowth of pastures and natural vegetation. And it was all the European settlers' fault. In 1859, the Clipper Lightning arrived from England with a dangerous cargo, 24 wild rabbits. They'd been imported by British farmer Thomas Austin, who missed the noble sport of shooting rabbits in the countryside. Now he could sit on his veranda of an evening and pop off a few. As he put it, the introduction of a few rabbits could do little harm and might provide a touch of home, in addition to a spot of hunting. Little did he know what a devastating feral scourge he'd inflicted on the nation. And within 70 odd years, I mean, the 20 odd rabbits had grown to over 10 billion rabbits, uh, which had a devastating impact on the landscape more broadly. Two dozen became thousands, then millions, then tens of millions. The spread of rabbits was helped as people realised there was big money to be made from rabbit meat and furs. And so drovers and trappers carried pairs of rabbits, letting them go well ahead of spreading populations. Pretty soon, much of the best pastoral country looked like a huge rabbit warren. Back then, wool sales were the lifeblood of the nation. Because of rabbits, the loss of pasture cut Australia's sheep numbers by half, bringing the country's economy to its knees. Australia was in a really sort of bad place uh, for, for many, many years with rabbits. By the 1880s, things were desperate, but a possible breakthrough came from a very unexpected place. In 1898, a scientist in Uruguay discovered a virus called myxomatosis, 
and it was suggested it could be used for rabbit control in Australia. But opposition to the idea was intense, and for the time being, the idea was dropped. Instead, they tried so-called rabbit-proof fences built along state borders, but the rabbits just got through by digging under them. As the 20th century rolled on, the trappers were having a field day. They were desperate times, and methods used to control the rabbits were often brutal and inhumane. Rabbit drives involved rounding up thousands of animals and clubbing them to death, with children encouraged to join in the slaughter. It may not have been high tech, but it was cost effective. There was only one way out, and the authorities resorted to a solution proposed over 50 years before. In the 1950s, uh, we released myxomatosis, a, a disease that devastated the rabbit population and then led to a resurgence of, of much of our wildlife uh, that was affected by rabbits and also gave agriculture a boost. They're ugly, full of poison and totally unstoppable. We're talking about the cane toad. At last count, there's a billion of these little critters hopping around the Australian countryside and they're killing our wildlife. Most of Northern Australia has succumbed to these feral invaders and they've reached 3,000 kilometres south, as far as Sydney. Now they're sweeping west towards the fragile Kimberley, wiping out native wildlife as they go. But there are many people doing their best to draw a red line in the dust. The Kimberley is a vast tract of wilderness. 420,000 square kilometres an ecological marvel miraculously unspoiled. Until now. Spread that grass. <laughs> Nightfall brings forth an army, the last line of defence in a desperate bid to stop an advancing enemy, the cane toad. Yeah, those ones around the light, there's a lot of them. The toad has pushed 2,500 kilometres west to the town of Kununurra, the latest battleground in its relentless march through northern Australia. Make sure you have a look underneath the bridge too. Ben Scott Virtue is Commander-in-Chief of the Kimberley Cane Toad Busters. The dedicated band of locals joined by volunteers, tourists and backpackers trying to make a difference. picking them off by the bag full. Each battle is a small victory for Ben and his team. But when you look at the sheer size of the region and the kind of terrain involved, it's clear who will win the war. The Kimberley will fall to the toads. And like many others, Ben has no sympathy for the creature. The only good toad is a dead toad. Cane toads are foreign invaders, but they were invited. Imported to Australia in 1935 by the Queensland government, they were supposed to eat the beetles, which were destroying the state's sugarcane crops. They never did eat the beetle, but today more than a billion cane toads are eating their way across the continent, and it's the poisonous glands that cause all the problems. Well, cane toads, um, they're the most hated feral. Uh, and the problem with cane toads is what eats them. On a creek in the Kimberley, scientist Sean Doody monitors the monitors, keeping tabs on families of goannas he believes will be wiped out by the end of the year. The toad's poison is a death sentence. Well, Merton's goannas love frogs. They see a cane toad, think it's a frog, grab it, and they actually don't even get them down. They uh, die from just mouthing the toad. It's taken 76 years, but these slimy invaders have become faster, hardier and more adaptable. Scientists say their evolution in the Australian bush has delivered almost a super toad that has conquered Queensland, most of the Northern Territory, and here in Western Australia, they're on the doorstep of one of this country's most iconic national parks. If something's not done about them right now, this Bungle Bungles area could suffer the same fate. 
Toad busters like Ben Scott Virtue are determined to fight this war to the final amphibian. The Kimberley is his line in the sand and D-Day is fast approaching. This is Lake Argyle, south of Kununurra, and Ben is here to check on how close the looming invasion has come. The news is worse than anyone feared. The calling cards of the colonisers are already in evidence. Yeah, it looks like uh, an olive python. I'm guessing that, um, unfortunately, this... Oh, my God. Ooh. ...has fallen prey to a cade toad. And it seems the toads have developed another amazing ability. These marathon swimming specimens are an astonishing six times faster than their ancestors of 50 years ago. <laughs> and that's the secret to the cane toad's prolific spread. Who knows, they are an incredibly hardy animal. I wouldn't put it past the toad to have swum even from, from that distance over on the eastern side of the lake. Scientists call the rapid evolution the Olympic village effect. Elite individuals mate together to produce faster, stronger offspring. It was the birth of the super toad. Well, this wet season, we've seen the largest movement that has ever happened on our recorded history. 85 kilometres in a couple of the corridors, toads have moved over this wet season. Absolutely phenomenal. Winding its way through the beehives is Piccaninny Creek the first creek system that the toads will use to access the heart of the Bungle Bungles. The Kimberley will be lost, and unless a long-term scientific solution is found, the rest of toad-free Australia will inevitably fall. What's the saddest for me is my kids are not going to be able to come out here and, and find the frillies and find the blue tongues and find the yellow spotted monitors. They're going to be gone. But things are looking grim. Scientists seeking that silver bullet recently lost government funding. And even if it finally comes, the war might already be lost. Just after dawn in far northwestern Australia, a highly trained Springer Spaniel is on the trail of a very damaging predator. A feral cat. Yep. The dog has been taught to single out the smell of these wild cats from the vast array of animal scents in the Kimberley. Suddenly, the target's in sight and the dog becomes a cat-seeking missile. It may look like your average moggy, when in fact it's the face of a deadly menace. Historical records date the introduction of cats to Australia at around 1804, with cats first becoming feral around Sydney by 1820. By the early 1900s, concern was already growing at the pervasiveness of the cat problem. 100 years later, and Australia has a crisis, with the cats roaming unchecked over 99.8% of the country. The Australian feral cat population is certainly smashing our wildlife every single day of the year, uh, 365 days of the year. The wild cat population is estimated to be between 12 and a staggering 23 million. With thousands more living in Australia's urban areas, rubbish dumps and intensive farms. The result? Since 1788, about 11% of the country's 273 native mammals have gone extinct, with a major factor being the introduction of feral cats from Europe. The cats are a major problem. They are one of the most 
uh, efficient predators on the earth, and especially in this country where they haven't got a predator against them. They are killing machines. They eat just about anything, including our endangered native wildlife. And the authorities are desperate to eradicate them. Our goal is very clear. Uh, defeat the feral cats. The black-footed rock wallaby is one of many native animals at risk of extinction. And although the tough zoo breeding programs are having good results, the wallabies can't be released into the wild because of the risk. Anything the size of a mid wallaby downwards is just a, a wonderful meal for a feral cat out there, unfortunately. The bilby is another creature under threat, with populations in the wild at critical levels. Feral cats are our biggest major disaster in Australia. Of course, the red fox has been there, but, but lately the feral cat has just gone and 23 million estimated Australian population. The crisis has prompted the federal government to commit to culling over 2 million feral cats by 2020. Right now we're engaged in the uh, world's most concentrated program. New technology has been developed, like this trap oh. that shoots a deadly toxin when it senses a nearby cat. The trap is proving successful with local wildlife numbers improving. There are 250 quolls roaming now in the Flinders Ranges that were once locally extinct. We don't hate cats, we just can't tolerate the damage that they're doing to Australia. But often the tried and true methods are the best. If you're trying to catch a cat, you can't go past a dog. But this cat's not going quietly. Good. Good girl, Sally. Right. Don't worry, mate. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Here he goes. Oh, there it goes. Come on. Go, Sally. Go. This time, the cat's in the bag. Got it. Yeah, we got it. Conservationist Ali Levitt says getting rid of the feral cats is at the top of her to-do list. We think across Australia we estimate there's a minimum of 12 million cats. Say they're each eating five native animals a day just to be conservative. That means you're talking about 60 million native animals every day eaten by feral cats. The wild brumbies have become a fixture of our mountains, forests and plains, and to many, embody all that's wild and free about this country, interwoven into Australian folklore. To others, they're seen as a threat and an enemy to be destroyed. Horses that are uncontrolled in the parks do cause damage, and the reason is, is they've got hooves. And, and before we brought horses and sheep and cattle to Australia, most of the animals were very soft paws, and so these, these introduced animals do cause quite a lot of damage to the, the, the park, and therefore the habitat of the native animals and plants. And it was environmental damage such as this that led to one of the most contentious events in the history of park management. This is the Guy Fawkes National Park in northern New South Wales. Remote, beautiful, and the scene of a terrible mass slaughter. In the year 2000, the National Parks authorities decided the wild brumbies, which had lived in the park for a century, had to go. Deeming the horses a feral pest, two masked men in helicopters were deployed. Between them, they gunned down 600 brumbies, leaving just 80 alive. The carnage broke the hearts of many locals who developed a bond with the brumbies. Terrible, terrible, especially when you see Horses that have been shot and not, not killed, and it's crippled, and half a dozen bullets in them, guts and everywhere. You know, it was shocking, really. For years, local farmers like Les Hume would ride in the park, trap the horses, and break them in for their own use, anything to save them from a bullet. In the wake of the brutal cull, the government began investigating the wild horses' heritage and found not only were they a destructive feral pest, but also the Brumbies were of important historical value. Since the 1830s, horses from the east coast of Australia had been exported for use by the British Army all over the world. 
Coming from New South Wales, they were dubbed the Whalers. Often found in the bush, these tough horses were of no distinct breed. They were the descendants of domestic horses who'd escaped or been turned loose into the ranges after the settlement of Australia. Many of these were harness horses from the coach company Cobb & Co. These horses were bred tough. In World War II, the Aussie Brumbies distinguished themselves as being able to travel further and faster over the cavalry breeds. There are many that are angry at the treatment of the Brumby since those glory days. At Armadale in northern New South Wales, Mark and Helen Stewart adopted this mob out of a sense of duty. Moringa. I think that the horses were used when it suited the government and then they were betrayed. Then they were betrayed again, I feel, when the National Park shot them in their ancestral home, not far from where we are here. Years later, another massacre loomed. The Snowy Mountains National Park straddling New South Wales and Victoria is Brumby country. And in these alpine regions, numbers have been exploding. There are many who wanted to see them out of there. And there were some who weren't going to wait around for the authorities. 150 odd horses over the last 12 months have been shot by people that haven't been qualified and they're taking the, the whole thing into their own hands a little bit. You know, it's not professionally done. The authorities freely admit they have struggled with the Brumbies' place in the fragile range plains of our national parks. They certainly don't belong in places like the Snowy Mountains. Um, what, now that there's so many of them, they get up into the Alpine region above the tree line. In those areas, you've got peat moss there, and so horses put in a trail, just going in there to graze each day, drains that peat moss out. So you've got about 200 species of plant that is unique to that area, and they'll just disappear from Earth if they disappear from that area. Nine out of 10 Brumbies are earmarked to be killed. Although most have understood the awful damage wreaked on the landscape by these feral invaders, the locals believe there were other solutions for the Brumbies beyond the bullet. And so a group of local expert horsemen devised their own plan. They identified where the Brumbies were and worked to get them out the traditional way, a muster. No easy feat in country like this. It's efforts like these, along with a massive public outcry, which finally led authorities to stay their hand. The proposed cull of the high country Brumbies has been halted for the time being, or at least delayed. Most people, when you explain the uh, devastating impact of pest animals, they're accepting of control, but it has to be done in a way that's acceptable to the community, otherwise you shoot yourself in the foot. The difference between the locust and the grasshopper is purely behavioural. Though not an introduced species, a locust can eat up to 10 times its body weight in one day and has become a hated enemy of farmers. When food and climatic conditions are favourable, huge swarms of locusts may develop. The threat begins with an infestation of juvenile locusts which hatch in huge numbers after rains and begin feeding on crops. At this stage, they are yet to develop wings. You can see the brown front line of the locusts eating their way through the crop fields. Huge efforts are made to destroy them while they're restricted to the ground by the spraying of poisons. Because once they mature and take to the wing, this is the horrifying result. Fronts can be up to 500 kilometres across, with the giant swarms travelling hundreds of kilometres every day. I think there would be billions, possibly trillions of locusts uh, potentially out there. The first recorded swarm was in 1844, with further outbreaks from the 1870s onward. Massive plagues occurred in the 1950s, 1970s, and right through to the 2000s. And those who suffer most are the farmers. We've got them where we always had them. That is, we've got locusts everywhere from Broken Hill across to Narandra and right down to the Murray. You go to the ground at night, they just chew away merrily and uh, clean about 200 acres up for us. I've been here for 30 years and it's the best crop we've had. It's the worst locust threat anyway. When I've had other vermin like emus and kangaroos that do a fair bit of damage, but these will do a lot more. But it's not just the countryside and farmland that gets hit. Towns are often inundated with huge swarms. 
and the locusts have become a genuine threat to safety on the road. They um, hit like hailstones on the car and you've got to clean your windscreen fairly often. Spraying is the regulation way of controlling the locusts, but other more low-tech methods have been devised. Or how about a hand-built insect vacuum? But it will take more than a locust buster to rid Australia of the ever-present menace of the locust. The Great Australian Outback, vast, untouched and teeming with unique wildlife. Well, at least that's the common perception both in Australia and abroad. Beneath this fantasy nirvana, there exists a very different, very alarming Australia. Our wildlife has suffered so badly at our hands and it's, it's paradoxical. You know, we're looking at one of the, the least densely populated areas on Earth with the highest mammal extinction rate. In Australia, we've lost around about 20 mammal species alone, um, which is over half of what the world has lost in modern time. Ecologist Stephen Murphy is all too aware that even in the most far-flung corners of the country, Australia's precious wildlife is disappearing. Scientists and researchers say that this decline in species is like a death spiral. It's like Australia's natural fauna has literally fallen off a cliff. This land that once teemed with native animals is now eerily silent. Whatever's happening in northern Australia, it's, it's a very subtle change. Because you look out, you, you fly across northern Australia, you look out the window of the plane, and it all looks intact. Tropical savannas of Australia look like they're doing OK. But you get on the ground and have a look around and you realise there's a lot of things missing. For the last five years, Stephen Murphy has been working in the Kimberley, tracking once abundant animals. Mammals like the tiny but feisty pale field rat. At one time, these little guys would have been a common sight. But they've been in the continent, evolving to Australian conditions for you know, well over a million years. In the last hundred years, they've been annihilated. He might look just like a rat, but he's an Australian rat, and he exists nowhere else in the world. They are what makes Australia, Australia. So he might look like a rat, but he's our rat. Our most endangered species may not all be cute and cuddly and certainly not household names, but the fact is Australia was their only home. And researchers fear which animal might go next. You know, I project back in time, you know, in the 1920s and 30s when there were still some of these mammals living in central Australia and I think, oh, you know, only if, you know, we were back there then, knowing what we know now, and we, could, we might be able to do something about it. It's like someone dropped a bomb in the middle of Australia and is now it's still reverberating out to the coastline. It's exactly what it's like. Three major problems in northern Australia are feral herbivores, so that's things like donkeys and horses, and unmanaged stock. Um, feral predators, so cats, and uncontrolled fire. And they're interacting in a pretty powerful way to cause these problems. Cats are extremely devastating to our wildlife. I mean, they're right throughout the continent, you know, from the southern tip of Tasmania to the, the northern tip of Cape York and, and through the deserts, they're everywhere. And they're live prey specialists, which means they only eat you know, what wildlife. They are a major impact on uh, a lot of the species that we're losing. And the, the big problem with cats is that they're very difficult to manage from a conservation point of view. You know, they're difficult to trap, they're hard to shoot, you can't find them systematically, so you can't go out there and, and count on, you know, shooting them. Um, and they're hard to, to bait, you can't, because they don't take dead baits. So basically they're holding us to ransom at the moment. When the occasional time where we, we do come across a cat and shoot it, um, we gut it. So check this out, this is a, the stomach contents from a cat 
feral cat that we shot just two days ago. And when you see the impact of just one feral cat, you understand the scale of the problem. That's a frog leg, looks like. These innards tell a tale of destruction that's repeated by an estimated 20 million feral cats across the country every day. They will, it's a rodent, native, one of the native rodents. We're up to, well, one, possibly two frogs, a bird, um, I'd say judging by that fur, maybe two small mammals. So that's one cat in one night. You, you know, back of the envelope calculation, magnify up and you're talking about hundreds of millions of native animals being eaten by cats every year. So dire is the problem that the federal government admits it's powerless to save every endangered species. We've got no real effective way of dealing with the feral cat. Preserving our native wildlife has fallen increasingly to private donors. Steve works for one of the biggest, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Uh, look, I mean, imagine that, Butch. Imagine being a small mammal trying to live there. You've got no cover left whatsoever. So if there's any cat, any earthing can be in this place, it's going to have easy pickings for the next you know, couple of months. The Conservancy buys up large tracts of land and turns them into nature reserves. So far, they own 20 properties, totalling nearly 3 million hectares. Okay. So mist netting is actually a really safe way to catch birds. On the Mornington property in the Kimberley, Steve and his colleagues do painstaking research into some of our most vulnerable animals. Here we go. Like the Gouldian finch. Yeah, he's... We are here, we have a crisis. We could do something about it. Um, and there's no reason why we can't. Australia's a pretty affluent country. You know, we should be able to spare the resources to, to fix this problem, which is in all of our interests. Whether we like it or not, we are part of an ecosystem. And if that ecosystem is collapsing around us, we would be very unwise to ignore that. By giving these lands back to our native wildlife, Stephen Murphy is already seeing dramatic results. But we have to reverse this disaster of our own making. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like there's a big job to be done. I love wildlife, I care about it a lot, and the fact that I will never be able to see a lesser bilby keeps me awake at night. It honestly does. And the fact that it's happening right now, on our watch in Northern Australia, it's sort of, it's chilling in a way. The evidence of a crisis is clear, but is Australia doing enough? Australia is still very much at risk from feral animals. I mean, our wildlife uh, is in the crosshairs for, for many pest animals. Australia's mammals once occupied vast areas of the continent. Thanks to the spread of feral predators, many now cling to survival on tiny offshore islands. Reintroducing these to mainland reserves will create important insurance populations for our disappearing species. These are not easy things to do. We've come a long way. We've got a much better recognition in the community of the damage that feral animals do, and I think let's not say it's all hopeless. We've actually achieved quite a lot over the last decade or so. There is much to be done, but realistically, the only solution is controlling foreign predators. Our native animal survival ultimately depends on us winning the war on the feral invaders.